Hello once again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and I'm here in Studio G with my helpmate. Yeah, that's Mrs. Pete. Say hello to 10,000 people. Hello. So, what's your purpose in this video? Cleaning. Same thing I do every day. Well, what are you going to use? Toothbrush. Look at that. Whose toothbrush? <laughs> Mine. Better not be mine because my teeth are already rotten and black and green. I don't want to change the color and make it even worse. Well, the purpose of this video is to introduce a three-part video on this beautiful South Bend lathe, the green lathe. You might have watched the other videos where I picked this up and then there was another one where I, I loaded it up and brought it home and, uh, and talked a little bit about it. And in this video series, the I'm going to clean the machine, not painting. You know how I hate You want to paint this for me? No, thank oh, you. You don't like painting either? No, no who does? Uh, some of those people, I don't know how many people out there have told me that I need to paint this thing, but you know, that just isn't going to happen. You know how much I hate painting, but we're going to have fun in this video. And in this first video, Mrs. Pete will be working behind the, the curtain most of the time, right behind me here, uh, while I do uh, some of the video uh, narration and so on. And I, I'm going to go through some of the parts here and point out different features of the machine and different problems with it. I haven't discovered all the problems, but this is a 75 year old, actually about an 80 year old machine, and it's worn out the same as I'm worn. 85 years, actually, is what this is 1938 or 1939. So it'll never be perfect, but we're going to have fun with it and. Uh, that concludes this little intro, and I hope you would enjoyed it. Now stick with me, and be sure and watch the two following videos, and watch the two previous videos. If I remember, I'll put uh, links in the description below. Thanks for watching. Say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Well, one thing more before I dismiss Mrs. Pete and allow her to go in and cook me a 16-ounce ribeye, Many people have been criticizing the paint job and saying, you know, it looks like John Deere tractor. And uh, I, I admit that the yellow there is absolutely hideous. And that part, I think I will paint or sandblast or something because I just can't stand that either. But uh, many people have said that that's John Deere green on the lathe, and it isn't. Show them, dear. That is John Deere green, and there's no similarity to the hunter green that uh, the school or my brother or my dad or somebody painted that machine long, long time ago. But I just wanted to show you what John Deere green looks like, and uh, I would like to return the machine to gray. Thank you, dear. You can go in and do your housework now before you come back and help me clean that machine. Well, I certainly have my work cut out for me on this machine. And in the way of review, this is not a 10-inch lathe. This is a 9-inch swing, and it's called uh, a tool room lathe because it has the collar attachment and the taper attachment and a few goodies like that. But do not confuse this with a 10-inch heavy. And from my research, they only made this machine for two or three years, maybe even less. And in about 1940 or 41, they discontinued this model and changed it to a, a slightly larger head, and it was called the 10-inch heavy. And that's probably the machine that you are the most familiar with. Now I'm back to talking about the color. Now this machine was this color in 1958 when my dad had it. I do know that. But if you take a look here, before I put it back together, this color of gray right here would be the original color from the factory and evidently they also painted the inside this ivory color at that time. I don't think that's aftermarket by my dad. When I brought this machine home a couple of weeks ago, someone had just stuck bolts in here. Grade 8, you know, it had to be pretty, <laughs> pretty tough steel. But anyway, I do not like that at all. So I have in stock these 3 8 and these are John Deere parts. So it's a John Deere rivet, but I like the, not the color so much as the appearance of that, and maybe I'll cut it off, as opposed to this. Tiny detail, it doesn't matter, I know, but those things are a big deal to me. 
You know, years ago they really overbuilt things, and I do very much like the bulbous shape of that casting, but can you imagine what that weighs even when it's empty? So it's got the nice swinging door with a hinge on it, the name, a vent under here. I don't know if you can see that, but that is vented. And then underneath there, there's quite a mechanism for the tensioning device. Most of you are probably familiar with that. And we were always taught to leave the handle upright like this at the end of the hour so the leather belt does not stretch overnight or over the summer or whatever it was. So when our lathes were inspected when I was a teenager, I think my dad would look down the row and every one of these handles better be in the up position. Or if it was the other type of drive with the motor back, that had to be loosened as well. Okay, here's the inside of the vent, and of course that's to keep the motor cool, I guess. There's plenty of other vents as well. Well, I believe the ivory color here is original, and what I did the other day, I thought, oh, we still got some paperwork here and here, and I cleaned this up as best as I could with a rag and some thinner, but it did not clean it up enough to read it, and maybe it doesn't matter, but I think the reference here is in regards to belt tensions and, and things like that down here, but I'm not positive. And again, that motor was, uh, if I can get the light, was put in there by my brother in 1969 approximately, or 70. So it's a more modern single phase motor and it is wired for 220. I thought I'd point this out while I'm at it. So we got a, a cast iron cover with louvers and a screw on the bottom and a screw right here so that can quickly be taken off for belt repair or uh, installing motors or uh, making adjustments or whatever. So that's pretty handy. Just two screws and off it comes. Again, that's cast iron, not sheet metal. Okay, there's supposed to be a cover right here and in fact, here it is. It's, again, it's cast iron and there's a scale. You can't see it. I got a scale right here. This cover weighs 11 pounds, and we got a little sight hole. I don't know what this is for. We got a porthole. Again, we got louvers here, and the reason there's so much sawdust on this part, this cover, is this has not been screwed on or put in place since oh 1970. And it, luckily, we found it at my roommate's house, my friend's house and it was hidden under something and in laying in this position and he's a woodworker so you can see there's a lot of, of uh, sawdust on it. One other thing of note, when this was painted a long time ago, they apparently didn't take the cover off and again here is the original dark gray color which is kind of attractive and this gives access to the wiring and I remember I had to unwire the leads in order to take the switch off in order to move the machine. Boy, I got to get my wife to work on this filthy thing. I'm going to point out any problems or defects or damage to this machine over the years, but notice right here, this handle has been broken off at one time and it's been brazed back on. Now that could have been done before Hitler went into Poland, who knows. Also notice the details here. This is a separate casting and there's even an oil hole right here, albeit totally clogged. Several things and comments that were made in regards to me moving this and binding it down and everything. Now I prefer chains and binders over uh, the, the straps and the reason for that is I'm used to binders and I've got a bunch of them and they never fail. And I do have a bunch of straps, but I'm going to have to confess something to you. I can never figure out the ratchets or the tightening mechanism on those darn things. I did have about 10 of them along and did not use them for that reason. I get frustrated and angry, so I know how to use chains. <laughs> now, when I did bind it down, I know that I put undue stress on this leg. And I even I thought as I bound it that I hope that doesn't break off, you know. But I had to get the job done, and I did, but many people noticed little details like that as I was doing it, and they're not too proud to mention it. 
Thanks to you people out there that are telling me about different things uh, in regards to these machines. And one man mentioned go to Vintage Machinery and find the 1939 South Bend catalog, and that's catalog number 100. And in that uh, catalog, you will find this exact lathe. And there is that little beauty. And they make a big deal about the one inch collet size, which gives you the big spindle. And that'll be explained in another video I've already made, but it has not been published yet. And one other thing that I was noticing here is that there is a chip pan on here. Mine does not have the chip pan. Maybe it was removed years and years ago. I do not know, but I'm going to show you something on the machine here in just a moment in that regards, and I'll get back to that. But this is the equipment that came with it, a couple of plates and the wrenches, and apparently the collets. Well, you know, I would have to read down here and, and find out what standard equipment was. I guess I haven't done that yet, but they did. They do call that the underneath belt motor drive. And uh, note, it is a nine inch. And do not confuse this with the, the model A, B, and C nine inch, because it's a much, much heavier uh, headstock with that capability of holding the one inch collets. Now, if you look in the 1940 or 41 catalog, you're, gonna, you're not going to find this. You're going to find the 10 inch, which looks darn near the same at a first glance. But reading here, it is a 9 inch underneath motor driven tool room precision lathe with the 1 and 3 eighths through spindle. And that's 12 spindle speeds. That's including uh, back gears, a hardened spindle, back geared, quick change, and steel gears and a double wall apron. Okay, if you look in the description here of the machine, you notice that the chip pan is included. Now looking back at the machine here, I don't see any evidence whatsoever here where there would have been a chip pan, but you see this piece of angle iron here? My dad had chip pans on every machine so that at the end of the hour, the kids could just take the whole pan and dump it into the waste can. So the pan slid right into here, but the bracket is missing over here. Maybe my brother took it off. I do not know, nor does it matter. Regarding the missing chip pan, now I realize that they must have made several variations of this machine because you can see that the chip pan attaches here, kind of like on uh, the one behind me. But notice here that there appears to be a little bit of a riser block. A separate casting and then the pan lays on that and in turn bolts to the lower leg like mine. So my leg is continuous from the floor all the way up to the bed. So I do not understand that variation but it must have been a cost saver. I want to show you a few modifications that my dad made on virtually every machine in the shop. Now, there were a lot of different machines. They weren't all South Bends, and uh, the chucks did not interchange. So in an attempt to keep the correct chuck with the correct machine, Dad had made these brackets like this, and you could store the extra chuck on there. It couldn't fall off. Some machines had uh, duals here, so it could hold two chucks. Also, the face plates were hung on a hook here. And there's another one right back here that you can't see. I don't know why there's two on this, but that's how it goes. And it was a, it's a pretty slick way of doing it. Boy, oh boy, do these face plates and chucks need a good cleaning. Where's my wife? Now, every machine in the shop, my dad's shop, had one of these little shelves put on here. And these were student made, and you can even see in the bottom here, where everything is brazed, because at that time there was no regular electric welder. It was all done with brazing, or in this case, even nuts and bolts here for the file holder. But that bolts right onto this rather heavy duty bolt, like that. And then you can put your oil can or your projects or your extra tools on that. And every machine had a holder for a file. 
And that file better be in that position at the end of the hour. And most of the files were the steep angle lathe files. I, I think you know what I'm talking about. So that's really a neat feature because as you know, there's just not enough room on a lathe to, to set things. And this little shelf here, which I'm going to talk more about, goes on top of the quick change gearbox. But you can see it's pretty darn small. You can put a few high speed steel tools on there, but not even room for an oil can. And there's the original color on the bottom of that as well. The tool room lathe came equipped with a collet rack for 5C collets. And a little tray here. And that's it. I just put it on there temporarily, but it just clamps onto the V-ways right here with that bolt. And this little loop here is for the draw bar. But let me draw your attention here to something else. Every machine in Dad's shop was equipped with a little uh, container for oil. And if it didn't have a collet rack, it was fastened some other place on the machine. But anyway, this container was filled with CMD, extreme pressure lube number three, anti-scoring, you know. Because back then we did not have live centers, ball bearing centers, they were dead centers. And they had to be lubricated, so this was on every machine, along with a little stick to help apply it to the uh, center hole. And you know what, even though it appears to be empty, Boy, does it have that characteristic smell of the CMD, and I have to admit liking that, and it reminds me of my father because when I was really small, my dad would come home from work and hold me in his arms, and he had a smell about him like this, and cutting oil, and it was not offensive. I love it, and it brings great memories. I perhaps give you too many details here, but this aluminum gear guard which pivots and swings as off of my nine inch precision lathe the, the model b not this one and uh, n notice that it's got a couple of nice tags on here but this thing is made of aluminum and weighs only three pounds as opposed to off of the the nine inch uh, tool room lathe this is cast iron. It does not swing or pivot. It has to be screwed on with uh, one, two, three screws, and it is quite heavy. Cast iron, in fact, it weighs nine pounds. So it weighs three times what this does. And it's probably 20 or 30 years older than the other one. Let's take a look at the tags. So the brass tag states that it's a nine inch swing and the bed is three and a half so it's quite a short bed and there's the catalog number. And here is the serial number on the end of the bed, 86169. I think the machine was made in 1938 or 39 or 1940 if anyone knows for sure. Send me a message, leave a comment, thank you. Well, that concludes part one, and it was a lot longer than I thought it would be, so be sure and join me in parts two and three, where I still intend to do the archaeology on this machine, and I'll get into the gearbox and many other parts to come in the next few episodes. So thank you for joining me. Thank you to my wife for being a good sport. See you next time. Leave me a comment and a thumbs up. It helps the channel a lot.